Well, good morning, everybody. We, as you can see, we've been moved back. We are making arrangements to remove the tables and just put chairs out. So we should be okay on room. Um, I talked to them. We'll have folding chairs and whatever we can get in here. But um, this will not be the normal setup. I had asked them and there was a miscommunication. They, they said that our class is 30 people, so um, they haven't visited. Eh. <laughs> but it's okay, we're, we're good, we'll figure it out. Um, this gives us a little bit of a problem for our Christmas lunch. So we're going to reach out this week and see if we can use the Alive Room that Saturday night. So we had it planned for the, what day? The Sunday, eighth? Sun, Sunday the 17th, right? Yeah. So we're gonna probably ask if we could use, if there's no basketball tournaments or anything going on, uh, use it the 17th, the 16th, which would be that Saturday night. We'll do it around six o'clock that Saturday night and come here and then have our party clean up and then put it back the way it was and then go about it. Unfortunately, that is not the most convenient for us because we, we, we would have liked just doing it for lunch, uh, but we don't have that opportunity anymore. It would be too, uh, too hard to set up right after service and it would just not be the most conducive. So we'll, we will get back to you. We are still having it. The question is, what day of the week it will be. Um, I, I would assume everybody would think Saturday would be the best, right? Saturday, the night before, would be the best. Hopefully that works for you. Friday, some people getting out of work or things like that is not always the most conducive, and we don't know what's going on with the, uh, the school. Yes, Friday's not good for the school. Friday's not good for the school. Saturday looks fine. Saturday looks good? Okay, so... Then let's plan on Saturday, and I will get it uh, lined up to use the Alive Room that Saturday. All right, so that's the announcement we have. We will get back to you once we confirm this week. Um, I'll get with Miss Sunday and just finalize everything, and then we will set it up for Saturday, but the same arrangements, everything else will be the same, and we'll go from there. So we haven't ordered anything as far as food yet, so that worked out well. Um, but we will be in here um, both Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings until um, we hear otherwise. It'll be a while. They are getting ready to tear down that old um, chapel, what, what the kids' auditorium, all of that's going down um, soon, I guess. Soon, yeah. The demolition guy comes Monday. Okay, so it's happening, so that'll go down, and it'll affect, um, so where the kids are going to be, so the kids are taking over the live room, so they can have a place for both Sunday school and their service. So, those are the reasons. It was a last-minute thing. I found out about it on, I think I reached out to Carl on Tuesday or Wednesday, but that's when we found out, so um, sorry for uh, all of this at the last minute but we are trying to be as supportive as we can and uh, we're looking forward to seeing a new building up. Um, so we're excited. Um, hope everybody's doing well. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. It's hard to believe. Um, Thanksgiving is on Thursday, so I hope everybody has a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving. There will be no activities on Wednesday night here whatsoever. Everything is shut down. Um, so uh, please be mindful of that. And then we will resume the following Wednesday. Now, for us, I want to give you a quick blip here. Um, we will continue in 1 Timothy this week and next week. And then for December, uh, whether you realize it or not, Christmas Eve is December 24th. That's a Sunday this year. So there will be no Sunday school. There'll just be 
the candlelight service instead of in the evening. They're going to do it at 10.30 in the morning. So you'll, you'll be asked to come to church. You can move that chair so people can get back there. And you can give me that chair. Thanks. Where are the lions? Perfect. Thank you, sir. Um, so the 24th, there'll be no Sunday school. And then the 31st, which is New Year's Eve, we will not have a Sunday school class and not have a live service. It will be online only. You with me? So 24th, no Sunday school, candlelight service at 1030. The 31st, no Sunday school, and then a virtual service only. Online, in your pajamas, at home, celebrate New Year's Eve. So those two Sundays, we do not have um, Sunday school. So there will be three classes for us in December, and I'm going to do a special uh, Christmas Sunday school um, called the Characters of Christmas, and we'll talk about all the many different characters uh, that we find in the Christmas story through the month of December. So we'll take a break from Timothy, go into the Christmas season, and then return in January uh, to conclude Timothy. Now, we also need to find out, I told you we had a lot of announcements. I haven't even prayed yet. We need to find out what do you want to do next. I try to get some some time. We're probably going to be in Timothy for a couple of months. I, I don't want to, First and Second Timothy... You know, a couple of months, maybe January and February. But then uh, I want to start getting an idea of what you would like to study next. Um, so I'm open to anything except Revelation. I just did it. <laughs> uh, any suggestions? Daniel? That's just as bad as Revelation. But <laughs> Proverbs? <laughs> I, Isaiah, okay, go, go ahead, give me a suggestion. I need something to click. Colossians. Galatians? Colossians. Colossians. We can, we can stay, yeah, we can stay in Paul's writings and do that. Okay, anybody else? What about Job? Job. <laughs> you guys are killing me. <laughs> Ecclesiastes, I've not done in the class. So that's a, that's a good one. Deuteronomy. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so you, you gave me a plateful. Let me start praying about it and see what God wants me to do. I really do. Um, I take your suggestions, then I pray about it and see what direction we want to go in. And those suggestions are very good. Um, if you've never studied the book of Daniel, it'll blow your mind. Um, since we've just done Revelation, Daniel is a good... That one is the, the one that's sparking me personally because it, it just coincides perfectly. And I think it coincides with our current um, state. Um, Daniel's good. Ecclesiastes is good. Um, Colossians, they're, I mean, nothing bad. Proverbs. Um, so let me pray about it. We'll see. we got a lot to choose from. Uh, and I just want to maintain what we haven't done. So to try to um, go through scripture. So thank you for, for doing that. We'll uh, let you know sometime in January where, where, what we're going to attack next. But thank you for being here. Um, appreciate it. We're going to be in here for the next long haul. So we're back in the library. The tables will be out moving forward every Sunday, and we'll have folding chairs up, and we'll have enough room for everyone. So welcome. Thank you for being here. We're in 1 Timothy. Say goodbye to my turkey. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 3 today. So let's pray, ask God to bless us, and then we will get started and jump right in. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the many blessings that you shower upon us, and we thank you for giving us this time to study your word. We pray that you would enlighten us. Your Holy Spirit would move in a powerful way in this room and speak to each and every heart in this room. We thank you. Father, we pray for this campus right now, for every teacher, facilitator, group leader, that your spirit would have his way 
on this campus today and people will walk out of this session knowing that they've met with you. We thank you, Father, for all that's taking place. We thank you in advance for what's going to happen um, on this campus over the next few months and years. And we just pray that your uh, spirit would hover over this place, that you would keep every worker safe, and that you would keep everything in line for the school and for the church to continue to move forward. We thank you. We praise you for all that you've done. And we give it all to you in the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus, our King, our Lord, our Savior. Amen. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul is um, writing this pastoral epistle. And now he gets to the point where he is reminding Timothy about what it takes to choose a leader and what it takes to be a leader. And, um, and leaders in churches come in all shapes and sizes. And there are many different functions that we, um, we believe should have these qualifications. So as we talk about them, I don't want you to limit yourself to pastors and then eventually deacons. But we're going to talk a little bit about this. I am a huge proponent in believing that pastors and deacons and teachers, um, anyone in a position of leadership, um, should abide by these qualifications. Um, so we're going to break them down. And there's also a very controversial part, part of this that we're going to do our best to explain and, and um, follow. So let's read a few verses. We're going to read through verse 7, and then we'll begin on our study today in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. This is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if, if, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So he's talking about the qualifications of, and here's where it gets a little bit, um, questionable because in the New King James Version it uses the word bishop. That term bishop has multiple layers to it. Uh, in our vernacular, bishop would be an overseer of many churches, maybe a region. Um, so it gets a little bit crazy, but really the term is synonymous with so you have bishop, you have overseer, you have elder, you have pastor, you have presbyter. Uh, why? Because the Greek word used here is the word presbyteros. Presbyteros. That is the Greek word used here. So from that word, you have the word presbyterian. Uh, so there's many beliefs in this, but for our understanding, it really is talking about Someone in a position of leadership, someone in a pastoral role of any kind. So these qualifications are for our, for our church leaders. That word presbyteros covers a multitude of people. Anyone in leadership, um, this falls under the umbrella. So it says, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, now, uh, in your version, it should say the same thing. Who has a different version? 
I'm reading from the New King James. Who has a different version that they're using? Overseer. Okay, read me verse 1 in, in the Overseer. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Very good. Anybody have a different version? Church leader. Okay. Church leader. Okay, great. Thank you. What what, what version is that? Uh, NLT. But read, read the whole verse for me because I want to focus on two things. This is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. Okay, church leader. Go ahead. What do you have? Yeah, I have the ESV. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Okay. Anybody else have a different version? Yes. I have the Amplified. This okay. is a faithful and trustworthy saying. If, a, if any man eagerly seeks the office of overseer, bishop, or superintendent, he desires an excellent task. Okay. Church leader, bishop, superintendent. I do believe that this word, again, the original word, presbyteros, means a position of leadership. So, in my humble opinion, everyone who wants to be in a position of leadership, what is leadership? Anything that causes others to come under your influence. So, if we're talking about a church... We're talking about anybody who's on the platform, anybody who's in a position of leadership. I, again, I'm a, I'm a big proponent that our teachers, our deacons, our ushers, um, all fall under this umbrella. You with me? Okay. Now, there's a lot of questions here in verse 1. One is, what is the position we're talking about? I think I've explained it. The second is this idea of women in leadership. There's a lot that Paul writes about the role of a woman in leadership. Some of these verses we just read from, some of these versions of verse 1, uses the term, like the New King James, it says, therefore, this, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position... If you notice, some of the other versions use the term, if anyone. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference there, right? Yeah. Here, it says, if a man desires a position. Then in the, the other versions, it says, if anyone desires the position. So we have to then address this um, clearly. The Bible gives us a lot of information about the role of women in churches today. I am, I was raised by women. Um, I have three sisters and a mom, and all were type A personalities, and I married a type A personality, so um, I, I'm used to strong women. However, in the church, we must um, follow what the Bible says, um, tells us about the role of women in church leadership. And it is very clear to me that women are not to be pastors. Um, women are not to be in a role where they are teaching men. Now, women are commended to be in roles of leadership when it comes with other women or children or young children. It's important, the role that they play. But in church leadership. Um, so then we get to the question about deacons. There's a lot of questions about deacons because in the book of Acts, we are introduced to, and in Paul's writings, we are introduced to women who were called deaconesses. So there's been a lot of challenges there with the question, should women be in the role of deacons? I think after all is said and done, a deacon is a person who is part of the church leadership. Thus, I believe that that is not a role for a woman because the Bible makes it clear that they have their role. Now let me stop and just say, 
I, I mentioned to you and as I was ending last week that this is going to get a little uncomfortable. But being raised by women and knowing the importance of women in the church and the women um, and what role they play, I do not want you to think in any way that I am diminishing the role of women in the church. But the Bible is clear that the role of or the qualifications for a leader give us a clear understanding that this is a role set aside for men. Um, any questions on that? So, again, it's a very touchy subject because um, it's, it's just this. So let's, let's move on. So those things have been cleared up. What the position is and who should fill those positions. So he is telling Timothy, if you look, if a man desires a position of bishop, uh, he desires good work. Now, again, this, the third part of this verse talks about good work or what they desire or how it works. We must understand that I also believe that church leadership is a calling. Teaching, pastoring, um, leading in a church is, is a calling. Uh, it's funny, today we're going to do the deacon nominations. That, that should not be taken lightly. Um, it is a calling. And I know our pastor well enough that he does not take it lightly uh, how this works and how the nomination process works, and how the approval process works. Um, but let's, let's jump in. So, this is a faithful saying. I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of bishop, he desires good work. A bishop, now he starts talking about qualifications. A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. So let's talk about some of these characteristics. Because the first thing you want to notice is that he addresses personal character. So a bishop, a pastor, a leader should be someone who has a good character. And when he talks about blameless... He is talking about no charges or serious wrong. In other words, this person's character should be irreproachable, untarnished. He must have a reputation of someone who has no issues that we know of. Now, I'm sure you've read newspaper articles or seen online or seen television shows of people who call themselves pastors or deacons or leaders, and they come out on the newspaper with their mugshot because they are doing something wrong. Now, obviously, God knows everything, but men, uh, you and I don't know everything. So we do the best we can when we're choosing our leaders. We do the best we can with what we know. But I believe that we, if we're standing before a holy God, and Paul is telling young Timothy, these people should be blameless. Nothing should go against them. I've seen churches, believe it or not, I'm not a fan of this, but they do background checks on their people. Anybody who is in a position of leadership, um, I've seen churches, and now, so there, there's a qualification here, because I don't know if I would do it for church leaders, but I, I've seen churches do it for people who are working with children. I do agree with that. Um, I know Orange County, if you're working in a school, I'm sure they do it here. Um, so th that's something that I definitely agree with, because we have some crazy people out there. So, a, then a bishop must be blameless. Now, here's where it gets a little bit wonky. It says, the husband of one wife. So, there is a lot to be said about this passage of scripture. 
and I've got a lot to say about this passage of Scripture because um, I open many commentaries. By the way, when I look at a bookstore and I'm looking for a new commentary, and there's a new commentary by another author that I don't know, there's a few passages of Scripture that I look at to see what this person's take on those passages are before I purchase the book. You with me? There's a few hot buttons for me. One of them is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. Why? Because there are some commentaries that you open, and it says clearly in the commentary that this is talking about divorce and that a pastor should never be divorced. And they, they blatantly write that, and that's what they believe, and that's how they operate. No divorce. So, does that what, is that what this means? First of all, let me just say, I am divorced. Many of you know that. Um, and it was a tough time in my life, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Um... It is a very, very difficult thing to have to deal with. But if I believed that this meant divorce, I would not be here teaching this class. I feel incredibly strongly about that. Because I believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And I don't have the right to white out what I don't agree with. So if I thought that this meant divorce, I promise you, I wouldn't have pastored for eight years. I wouldn't be here in this position. I would just do what I'm supposed to do if, according to this and be silent and be in the church. But I do not believe for a second that this means divorce for many reasons. And I want to share them with you and then we're going to go on to see what I believe it does mean. Divorce. First of all, the word divorce was very common. This is not a new term. Jesus used a term. This is not a term that was foreign to anybody. So I am, I am adamant, and I'll ask Paul when I get to heaven, but I am adamant that he did not mean divorce because if he meant divorce, he would have said divorce. It's, it wasn't a foreign term. It was, husband of one wife, what does that mean? We'll talk about it, but I truly believe it doesn't mean divorce. For one reason, common sense tells me he would have used the term. Paul had no problems addressing difficult situations. And often Paul would address them head on. There would be no, no ambiguity. There would be no uh, cloudiness. Paul, though he spoke very um, eloquently and often you know, had a very eloquent way of doing it, he was also in your face and very direct. So, I don't believe that he means divorce. I don't believe that, I have a hard time, and I've seen this in my own experiences, I have a hard time thinking that this refers, refers to divorce for another reason. I have seen in my lifetime people who have come out of jail who have committed heinous crimes, got saved in prison, come out of jail, and they get called, and they go to seminary, or they don't even go to seminary, and they just become a pastor of a church. So, this here, if it means divorce, means that if you are divorced, you have to wear the scarlet letter, and you can't do anything in leadership, but if you've committed anything else, anything else, you're okay except divorce. Now, where in the common sense world does that make sense? Again, um, there are questions about this idea of being blameless. Nothing can be held against you. Then, then, then why could you come out of prison having been found guilty of committing a crime, served your time, but now you're out so where does the blamelessness come in? You see where the questions come in, right? You see where it gets a little muddy. Why? Because he uses the term, must be husband of one wife. So let me just say to you, what else could this mean? 
Does it mean that you have to be married, that a single person can't be a pastor? I don't think so. I have a friend, a very close friend, many of you know who he is, who pastored up the road here for 10, 12 years, and now is the pastor of Charles Stanley's church, uh, First Baptist Atlanta, um, Dr. Anthony George, great friend of mine, who is single, 52 years old, single, never been married. According to this, if you take this literally, he's not qualified to be a pastor. But does that make any sense? No. So I don't think it means divorce. I don't think it means that you must be married. You know, I, I read another commentary that said, oh, it has to do with being married because a single man lacks experience. So did I buy that commentary? No. I'm very careful about who I pay attention to and who I, uh, I look at as someone who can direct me. And, and don't get me wrong, there are some commentaries that 98% uh, of it I agree with and 2% they say some things that are out there and I don't agree. But I have to decipher what I can go by. Same way you should decipher what I say. I don't want you to walk out of here considering me the gospel. I just... I just am going to show you what I believe the Bible says. So, I don't think it means divorce. Because divorce was a term they were already using. Because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit the narrative. Um, it doesn't mean that you must be married. I, I don't believe that either. Um, some One commentator wrote that if your first wife dies, you must not remarry. Um, because that would be considered adultery. Um, I, I don't even know what to say to that. Um, I know of a very, 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 very prominent pastor who, whose wife divorced him early in his ministry. He was probably pastoring 10 or 15 years, and his wife divorces him. And he decides that this passage means you, you must not remarry. It was okay for him to be divorced, but he must not be, he must not remarry. But I guess it was okay to shack up. But enough said. So what does this passage mean? A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife. Well, what does it mean? Well, I truly believe... Please hear me out when I say this, and I mean this. I believe that this means, and I'm going to add my own words to this, okay? So I'm editing scripture just for the sake of this group right here. A bishop must then be blameless and the husband of one wife at a time. Now, I know that sounds comical. But I truly believe that that's what this means. Why? Because polygamy was a major, major, major problem. If you read the Old Testament, you know polygamy was a major problem. Anybody know how many wives Solomon had? Anybody know how many, how many wives did Abraham, Isaac, Jacob had? Now, people say, well, by the time the, 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 the New Testament came, polygamy wasn't that much of a problem. Yes, it was. Believe it or not, it's still a problem today. So I truly believe that if someone is going to be a leader of a church, they must be married to one woman. Polygamy is not something that we want in our churches. Imagine coming to church in a minivan 
And instead of coming out with six kids, you come out with three wives. I always say, I can barely handle one. So I do believe that this has a lot to do with marrying more than one woman. I believe it was a cultural problem in that day. In Utah, it is still a problem today. Um, uh, I'm not saying anything else. I'm trying to be very calm and peaceful. But I do believe, again, and I'm going to say this not, not, to, not to repeat it just for the sake of repeating it. If I in any way believe that this referred to divorce, I would not be teaching. I wouldn't. If this was something that I felt I was disobeying the word of God. Does that mean I live a perfect life? Does that mean I don't make mistakes? Is that No, no, none of that is true. I am not perfect. Don't look at me in any way, shape, or form as some kind of holier than thou. I make my mistakes every single day, and I ask forgiveness and I seek the face of God and I do everything I can but if I knew that this meant divorce I would not be standing here even if I didn't agree with it I would not dishonor our God so I believe that and 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 believe it or not there are many many churches including Baptist churches that will not nominate a, uh, a divorced deacon They've been divorced, they, not, they, they are not qualified. Guy's out of prison, he's qualified. He's paid for his crime. But if you've been divorced, and I've been a member of those churches, and I honor what the leadership wants to do, but I do not, I do not respect it. There was a church that I attended for a few years, and the church will go nameless, that I wasn't able to be a deacon because of my situation, but they would invite me to preach on Sundays. I don't get it. But anyway, enough said. I'm stopping. All right, so a bishop then must be blameless, husband of one wife. I think I've hammered that point. I'm not going to say any more, though I could. Then it says, temperate. Temperate. Now, every time the Bible talks about this idea of being temperate, they are talking about one thing. Though here, it's a little bit questionable because of verse 3. Well, this version doesn't do it, but that's okay. We'll, we'll get to it. Temperate. Temperate has to do with avoiding extremes in spiritual matters, but it also has to do with food and drink. Now, some would argue let's talk about food I was pastoring my church and I walked in on a Sunday morning to my office and there was a letter in a sealed envelope under the door and I opened the door and I took the letter and I sat down and I opened the letter and it was quoting um, 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. And he underlined, I, fi I figured out, they didn't sign the letter, but I figured out who, who did it. And I'll tell you a funny, not a funny story, but I'll tell you something about this. So I, I read the letter, and basically the letter said that I was too overweight to be pastor of the church. And he didn't say overweight, he said fat. 
he, he left out the husband of one wife, but he targeted on this idea of being temperate. And he showed me definitions of the word temperate, and it talks about controlling what you consume and not being um, glutton. And he said, basically, I was too fat. And he didn't sign the letter. I found out, and, and later it was admitted to me that he wrote it. Um, what do you do? That's a Sunday morning. I'm getting ready to preach. And I get that letter. Um, needed a lot of prayer that morning. Um, but this idea of being temperate means that you don't run hot and cold. Uh, I think the word temper is in there. Um, it really means controlling yourself and avoiding extremes, especially in spiritual matters. Now, I've met many people who you can talk to and they're very friendly right now, and 10 minutes later, they're like out of control. They're screaming at everybody. They're nasty. They're just... And, and they just go from... from Hot, cold, nothing in between, everything's extreme, and they have a bad temper, and you're all like waiting, okay, let's see when they explode. This is the idea of being temperate. However, we must also be temperate in all that we do. And one of the things that often comes to mind is this idea of alcohol. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Here we go in the holidays and he's going to ruin my buzz. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The first miracle in the Bible was the wedding at Cana. And Mary's, uh, Mary, Jesus' mother, was in charge of the ceremony, of the reception. And... It was very cultural to serve wine. Do I believe that Jesus drank any? I don't know. But oftentimes in Scripture, it says, Be sober. Do not be drunk with wine. It talks about having control over it. And if we look at this from a fleshly purpose, somebody was going to say to me, well, I can hold my liquor. <laughs> and you may be right. But I am of the mindset, forgive me if I offend you, but I believe nothing good comes out of a bottle of alcohol. Zero. If you need a drink because you had a rough day at work and you just need to calm your nerves, you got a problem. You may not be an alcoholic, but you've got a problem. If you need to stop somewhere before you get home just to have a few because, you know, just the, all the stress and you can't get home and, and deal with more stress and you need to calm your nerves and that's part of your routine, you've got a problem. You've become dependent on alcohol and I'm just going to tell you, you have no business being in a position of leadership at a church. Nothing good comes out of a bottle. Oh, but you know, I like to have my beers every once in a while. I like it just, it's a, listen. Let me ask you a question. You have a group of friends from church and you're going out to dinner. And you know that one of the persons that you're going out with, woman or man, doesn't matter, 
has had a problem with alcohol. They are an alcoholic. And they struggle with that every day. And once you're an alcoholic, people say you're always an alcoholic because one drink will lead to a second drink and a third drink. So you're going out with this person and this group of people and you know that they are with you in the group. And for the sake of trying to be temperate, for the sake of trying to be sober-minded, you decide, though it's your custom to have two beers with dinner, or though it's your custom to have a glass of wine with dinner, though it's your custom to have an alcoholic beverage with dinner, because that person is with you, you're going to respect their situation and not order alcohol. My question to you is, would you still order or would you not? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but most of you, knowing you, you would probably respect what that person is going through and not order that alcoholic beverage. And if that's the case, you should never drink. If your drinking can cause somebody else to stumble, you should never drink. If your alcoholic consumption I told you this story plenty of times. I used to teach a Sunday school class. We had 90 people in the class, 90 people. And everybody I talked to was invited to this birthday party, everybody in the class. Are you coming? I'm expecting you to come. No, I wasn't invited. Wasn't invited. Kind of found it funny, but wasn't invited. You know, I was offended, but I wasn't invited. Two weeks later, I saw pictures inadvertently of the party. And they were all... I don't know, 50 of them sitting at a really long table, and all I saw on the table was alcohol, pitchers of beer. And then I said, oh, okay, now I know why they didn't invite me. Because they wouldn't have felt comfortable with me sitting there while they're drinking alcohol. Because they know my position on alcohol is I don't drink. I personally don't drink. I don't have a need for it. I don't like the taste of beer. I just doesn't do anything for me. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. I was in Bush Gardens in Virginia one time, and it was 102 degrees, dying. And we walked into the Anheuser-Busch Pavilion. The air conditioning was fantastic, and the only beverages they had free was cold beer. Ice cold beer. Okay. I'm dying, sweating up a storm. I sweat, as you, you've seen me teach, I sweat for anything. So I'm dying, it's hot, the air conditioner's not enough. I grab a, I don't know, a cup about this big. They were just giving them as samplers, but you could have as much as you want. But they were in small cups, and I grab, and it was cold. I could feel it to the hand, it was cold. And I put it to my mouth, and I was like, that was the worst thing I've ever tasted. It was, na how people drink it, don't get it. Nasty. That's my personal take on it. You know the reason I don't drink. It's because when I was in high school, a person who befriended me invited me to a party. I was a high school senior, invited me to a party. I was in a new city, new surroundings, no friends. He befriended me. The first day I was in class, said, hey, come, come on, let's go. We're going to a house party. We go to the house party. Guy's name is Rodney Bratcher. Never forget him. I met him once. It was very, very nice to me. He was the kicker on the football team. And we go to this party, and I'm there, and I'm, he's introducing me to a few people. Then he disappears, and I'm just talking to people, and then I hear screaming. And I go into the bedroom where he was, and he was passed out on the bed. He had asphyx asphyxiated. He had drunk so much that apparently while he was laying down, because he felt like he needed to lay down. This is the story I'm told. That while he was laying down, he vomited. And he was so passed out that he couldn't get rid of the vomit like most of us would do out. He ended up choking on his own vomit, and he died right there. So I wasn't a drinker. I never had been. I grew up in church. I never was a drinker. But my personal take on it is that I don't need to drink. So I have my own personal take on it. But the Bible it gives us some indications on it. 
A bishop then must be blameless, husband of one wife, temperate. Here it says sober-minded, which means not giddy, not frivolous, serious, earnest, discerning, discreet. Um, I also, I also equate sober-minded with people who tell dirty jokes. I'm not saying anymore. Um, a bishop must, this, must then be blameless, husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, well-ordained in his habits. Good behavior, hospitable, lover of strangers, someone who is welcoming, someone who is warm. And then he says, able to teach, to feed the flock. We've got a lot more to discuss. Verse 3 says, not given to wine. Given to wine means addicted to it. But how do you get addicted to something if you've never tried it? That's why I say nothing good comes out of a bottle. Because this idea of addiction, and by the way, this, this idea of addiction also goes with people who are addicted to pain medication. Also goes with people who are addicted to some sort of pharmaceutical thing that they have to have to, to just maintain. And don't, don't send me any notes. Don't send me any. And don't complain to me. But, you know, I have got, you know, I've got these issues and they gave me this medication. And not given to wine. Not violent. Not greedy for money, where the love of money causes you to do things that would be considered inappropriate. And gentle, but gentle. Not quarrelsome. Gentle gives me the picture of forbearance, patience, a yielded spirit. Not quarrelsome. You met it, you're, have you ever met anybody who wants to argue about everything? Just everything is an argument. Every, listen, you can walk outside in a beautiful Florida day and say, ooh, isn't that a beautiful blue sky? And they're like, no, you don't understand. how." The, and, and, it's, and it's not just arguing. They literally, they just, they want to tear your head off. <laughs> Over the silliest things. And, and I don't believe that any of these descriptions belong in our church. Now, I know we're talking about, and I've got to end and we'll pick up back here next week. But I know we're talking about church leaders. But I do believe, I do believe that this should encompass a Christian. This should be a picture of... Of a Christian life. Amen. Because how do you pick your leaders? Out of the congregation. And how do you find them out of the congregation? If the believers are living a life like this. Can you imagine what our churches would look like. If we held on to these qualifications. If we held ourselves to these standards. There's more, not covetous. One who rules his own house well. Having his children in submission with all reverence. Listen. We shouldn't give our children a choice whether we're coming to church or not. We're coming to church. And as long as I'm paying for the house... And you're living under my roof. 
obviously, you know, um, we got parents today like, oh, do you want to go to church today? Do you want to go to church today? That's the problem. Who's the leader? Right. There's got to be somebody in charge. You've got to be in control of what's going on at home. Listen, we are going to church today. You can decide what you're going to wear. But we're going to church today. Do you, do you want to go to school today? Anyway, I, I, I'm going to stop. This is a, a mouthful. But I do believe that these qualifications, though they're laid out, for choosing your leaders, I believe it should be for everyone. Think about that. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the challenges that we get from this passage of Scripture. And we pray that in all that we do, that we would hold ourselves accountable to your word. That it is your word that will direct us. Your word that gives us guidance. Your word that keeps us in line. May we be followers of your will for our lives. And Father, though I know this passage is for qualifications for bishops and leaders, but I believe that we should all be held to this standard. We've all been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we should all be accountable to what you want for us. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask you as we enter the worship service that you would be with us and bless us as only you can. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said. Amen.